All right. Hello, everyone. <laughs> now you're good. Hello, everyone. <laughs> uh, thanks so much, Jim, for having me back. This is my second time speaking at Jamstack Boston. I originally was here, oh man, it was over a year ago now, I think. And that was talking about StepZen, which is a GraphQL API company. But I have transitioned out of the, well, it's funny, I transitioned out of the GraphQL world to the Web3 world. And as soon as I started working at this company, the Web3 company I was at bought a GraphQL company. So it's going to be some interesting crossover there, but we're not going to get into that today. But I'm working on some like kind of blockchain NFT GraphQL guides right now, which is, which is super fun. But we're just going to talk about today, basically what is Web3 and how does it intersect with current Web3? technologies, especially the Jamstack, because the Jamstack is this idea of how do we build websites or web apps that are decoupled. Like you have your front end, which can be just like a static front end that's querying some sort of back end. And all you need to do that is an API from that back end. And then they don't have to live together in the same project. They don't need to be this you know, complicated monolith that requires 30 minute long deployments and all that. So if you're someone who's heard of the Jamstack, you probably heard the pitch of like why it's a, a useful thing, but it gives you more resilient, more reproducible, nicer DX kind of experience. And what's interesting about blockchain is that the blockchain itself is like a backend API in a certain sense. Now it's different because it's decentralized. So I would first talk about like, what is the difference between decentralization and decoupling? Because you, you mentioned that in the, the intro. So with decoupling, it's about having an app that's made up of pieces that are separate, but communicating with each other. So that's usually a front end and a back end, and they're speaking to each other over a REST endpoint or a GraphQL endpoint or RPC calls or something like that. But what's cool about blockchain is that it allows you to do that, but you're not hitting a centralized API. Because that's the thing is if you're hitting an API, usually you're hitting Contentful's API, you're hitting a WordPress API, you're hitting an API that is owned by an individual or a corporation or some, some sort of entity. Whereas with a blockchain, it's an API that is collectively owned by the set of people running the network. So that's what they mean by decentralization is that you can't run a blockchain on a single computer. If you just have like one computer running a blockchain, like it's not a blockchain. A blockchain is a bunch of people who have like a database on their computer that is a shared ledger that allows them to track things like transactions. So to kind of simplify that down to like a, a basic example, imagine that me, Jim, and Stephanie, we all want to invent our own coin. We want to invent Jamstack Boston coin. And we're going to start off where each of us are going to have 10 Jamstack Boston coins. And each of us have a ledger on our computer saying each of our account balances. And if I want to send Jim five of those coins, then all three of us need to update our ledger saying, I now have five, Jim has 15, Stephanie still has 10. And so we will all update that on our own blockchains and then the blockchains together have a form consensus of like what is the correct state of the world and the reason why this is something that first started in currencies and with cryptocurrencies is that we think about it, like you can't defraud this because if you try and give yourself a million dollars all the other people in are like wait you don't have a million dollars that's not in my ledger so it allows people to kind of keep each other in check in that respect and this is why people will talk about how decentralized is a blockchain. So if you think about it, if you have a blockchain and there's 100 computers running that blockchain and one person owns 99 of those computers, then they could just change it. So there's these things called like 51% attacks. But that's kind of the, the main idea is that you have a bunch of computers that form a network and then that network holds data that people can interact with. And so that data can represent money. It can represent art. It can represent uh, like financial uh, algorithms, it can, it can represent essentially anything you can think of. But the cool thing is that because it is just an API, you're going to query it from a front end. <laughs> like So once you start getting into this Web3 stuff, you're going to start seeing all these examples and it's like React applications that are just like hitting this contract address and then getting this data back and then displaying it in React components or Svelte components or something like that. So this is something that I was saying before I even got a job. A quick note is that 
you can't build a web three application that is monolithic. Like it's literally impossible <laughs> because of the, the fundamental architecture of it. So web, the, thus web three is Jamstack by default. So questions from that first spiel. Anybody? So I guess, um, so I, I, I love the, the pitch that, that clears up a lot of things, but I'm curious, um, I mean, couldn't you have a monolith sitting on a server that has a front end and a back end and, and query these APIs or what, what is, I guess, what is the challenge between having your front end be distributed and interacting with the decentralized nature of blockchain? Yeah, because the, 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 the blockchain itself is made up of a bunch of what are called nodes. So a node is like a, a server, basically. And they're all you know servers. You can run them in your house. You can run them on AWS. You can run them on DigitalOcean. So Quick Node is a infrastructure provider that runs nodes for you and then gives you access to a, a kind of global API. So it wouldn't really make sense to run the the node and the front end together because if you change if you're trying to like develop and you like make a change to the node that change doesn't mean anything until that change is accepted by all the other nodes on the network so the the back end is controlled by a decentralized distributed group of people so you don't really have ultimately control over the back end that much unless you get into a blockchain that has like governance built into it where you can like vote on stuff with your tokens that's kind of like a, a huge rabbit hole but the the main thing is that the the blockchain usually, once it's deployed, it doesn't really change. So that's why you don't really develop with the front end and the back end. Once the blockchain is out into the world, it's like a protocol that you're going to interact with. And you're not going to, you don't rewrite TCP IP when you're developing a web app. Like that's, it's just the same. And HTTPS is the same. It's always going to be the same. So the blockchain is kind of set in stone to a certain respect. And then it needs to stay up and running. So you need people running these nodes. You need people running the back end. But for the people actually developing what are called dApps, decentralized apps, all they're doing is developing a front end that's querying this blockchain protocol mm -hmm. that was already defined in code. Ah, uh, yep. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, that's kind of like the whole idea of the Jamstack, right? Is the, these microservices calling out to them to do work that you can't do in just your front end. So yeah, that makes sense. Cool. And so a couple just other terms that would be good before we actually start looking at the code is when you are talking about this kind of stuff, usually people will think of like Bitcoin is, is typically the first kind of like blockchain application that most people became aware of and would kind of spark this like whole craze. But what's interesting is that Ethereum added additional functionality that Bitcoin didn't have. And so what Ethereum did is Ethereum gave developers the ability to actually embed a program in the blockchain. So before it, what it was is you had wallets that held funds and you could write logic that would transfer funds from one wallet to another. And like, that's what Bitcoin was. It was a currency and everything about it was kind of around that idea. But with Ethereum, they're like, okay, what if we take the same idea, but we allow people to actually write a program? Like, what if we allow someone to write like Uber in the blockchain and then you could deploy this back end and if you could write Uber in one go, you know, so that's kind of like <laughs> one thing is that you're you're going to be writing these things over a long period of time, kind of adding functionality, it's usually additive kind of thing. But with program, with smart contracts, you can like embed a program into the blockchain. And what's really cool about this is that it'll, they call it a contract because you can't change it. So once you actually deploy this and it has a certain API that people are going to depend on, they can depend on that forever because it's baked into the blockchain and you can't rewrite the blockchain history. So you can update a smart contract. You can create a new smart contract that changes it and then you could try and get people to upgrade to it, but you can't revoke a smart contract once it's deployed to a blockchain. So it gives you a certain amount of like security in terms of like, we, we build on so much like open source stuff that's just like constantly changing. We build on so many services that are built by startups that are constantly like rewriting their stuff, you know? So I feel like just having software that is like intrinsically stable is is a really interesting idea. And this also gets into things like IPFS, which allows you to actually like save content in like a Git-like form. That'll be a, another talk that I'll have to give someday. But um, the, the idea is that you can have things be immutable on the blockchain. And then also you are accessing it through what's called a, a crypto wallet. And this is why a lot of people will talk about 
terms like ownership and permissionless when they talk about Web3 because anytime you're interacting with a blockchain, you have a crypto wallet and you have like a private key with that crypto wallet. And like you own that and that's the entirety of the whole deal with everyone involved. And this is a little different from something like Coinbase because Coinbase kind of holds your keys for you. But for the most part with Web3, it's like a technology that's centered around individuals versus traditional web platform stuff, which I think is based more around platforms. Like you think about who benefited the most from web up to this point is Google, Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, you know, but this is a technology that actually is built around individuals and how individuals interact with the blockchain and how they can get value from these applications. Cool. Um, we can get to the code. So is the code that you're showing, is it built on Ethereum since you can write programs in that blockchain or is it something else? Yeah. Yeah. I, I said in the original um, uh, meetup description that was going to be Avalanche, but the two are almost identical and for the sake of Web3 beginners. It doesn't really make much of a difference. Oh, okay. <laughs> but um, yeah, so it's, 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 it is Ethereum. It's not Avalanche, but um, there's these other chains that are coming out that are what are called EVM compatible, which basically means they want to give you the ability to write a program exactly the same as Ethereum, but then deploy it on a different blockchain because Ethereum is like kind of slow and ridiculously expensive mm. and has mm -hmm. some like problems associated with it. But that's because it's sure. like established and everyone's using it. So there's this kind of race to build the next Ethereum. And some people will do that by building a whole new programming language that's not Solidity. And then some people will do it by building a whole new blockchain with the same programming language. Yeah. So this question maybe is missing the mark on some of the stuff you're talking about, but um, you know, we have these things, these tools, and I, and I don't think these are exclusive of what you're going to show, but you know, we have things like Git and we have um, even history that can be kind of um, laid out and for programs in like Docker. So like Docker Hub can have like a history of releases and things like that. Um, is the idea behind releasing... Um, programs on something like Ethereum that not only is that his, that history is no longer essentially controlled. So like I, I could have an open source project, but I could at some point take it down from GitHub and destroy my Docker hub and get yeah, rid of that. Or, so like it's no longer, your, your Git history in, in weird my, ways. Yeah. I could, I could force push and change that history. Mm -hmm. And and the idea here is that like that is owned by the community, like truly, and that cannot be changed. Um, although I could continue releasing new things. It's not like I've locked myself into an old way of thinking. I could change things, but everybody in the community has access to the full history and can revert or stay at any point in time. Is that kind of the thinking? Yeah, because it's an append only log. If you think about it, you can add something to it, but you can't take something mm. off of it unless enough people on the chain collectively decide that someone wrote a program so bad that we all need to collectively <laughs> decide to reverse it, which did happen once. Ethereum had a program that had a bug in it that led to hundreds of millions of dollars just like disappearing. So oh, yeah. The a core team basically said, we're going to fork it. We're going to go back to the point before we mess this up. And then we're going to make that the chain. Yeah. And what about the case where, okay, say I'm a small developer and I'm working on something and I, I release API keys or things like that, security vulnerabilities in there. I'm kind of, I have to get consensus from the community now to revert or change that. Is that? Um, so when it comes to the, the private key kind of stuff, if you, are using tools that allow you to kind of like embed a private key into it you can kind of swap stuff like that out a little more easily so there's like there's there's things in the blockchain where you like expose certain apis that can't really be changed and well i guess it's it's, it's, the, it's true that you would you would need to like change the, the contract address ultimately because you can you can always basically like roll your keys essentially and redeploy the contract and then the contract will be mostly the same and it'll, people will still interact with it the same, but it'll have a different contract address. So if a contract gets compromised and you need to fix it, you deploy a new contract and then you give people that contract address and then they swap it out. And so that's one of the things I'm, I'm going to show in this example is we're going to deploy a like, very simple smart contract. We're going to get that address. We're going to put in our app and then we're going to like kind of query it. Great. Cool. Excited to see it. Yeah. And then as I'm going, like people feel free to um, stop me and ask questions at any point. So I'm going to share video. Wait, how do I share? Oh, there we go. Bam, bam. All right. Cool. 
So let's start off by just looking at kind of what's happening in our project here. So who knows Svelte here, aside from Jim? Probably Brittany. Yeah, she would be the other, <laughs> the other Svelte, Svelte master here. Yeah, so Svelte is a front-end component library similar to React with some certain architectural and syntactical differences. But the most important thing is that you have like a root component, which is hanging out here, your app component. And in our app component right now, I have a lot of things commented out because I want to just start us off with our like simple kind of spelt hello world. So we all start on the same page here. So this is going to do is this is just going to display a little div. That div is going to have a little waving emoji and then H1. And the reason why it says wave to AJC Web Dev is because the application is going to allow you to basically write a message to the contract and then that message gets saved on the blockchain. So taking this off and I, I talked about this a little bit before we start recording. Right now this is using like roll up and kind of like the old school way of doing Svelte. Eventually we're gonna figure out how to do this with Svelte Kit. And then that's gonna be the move. So let me do this in Chrome. Oops. Okay, so here's our Svelte component. Just saying wave to AC Web Dev. Let me add hello from Chance Now. I don't know why it looks also like an H1. That's weird. <laughs> okay, now there's going to be the Svelte project, and then there's going to be like the Web3 kind of parts of the project. So now that we have our Svelte application set up, let's just look at kind of like what are the Web3 things that are happening here. Now, this is our smart contract. So you're going to notice here that this is a programming language that will look foreign to you, most likely, unless you already know Solidity, but it's similar to C and JavaScript and Java it takes bits and pieces from other well-known programming languages. So you have like e things like enums and structs and then, you know, uints and uh, arrays and events. So most of this stuff should be fairly comprehensible, but just kind of go through it. What's happening here is we're defining a wave. And so the wave is just a little message and then the message will include the address of the person who is sending the message. So if anyone out who's watching this also has like a crypto wallet already installed in their browser, they can interact with this project. And then you have a timestamp that's going to timestamp the message that they're going to send. And then we're going to have a array that's going to save all the waves together. So as multiple people add messages, it's just going to keep a whole list of those. And then we're going to display that list on the page. And then we have a new wave. So anytime a new wave comes in, that's going to then have the functions that are going to either wave, get all waves or get total waves. So most of the important stuff is happening here in the, the wave function. And it's taking in a reaction which the first version of this application had like you could wave or you could send cake or you could like send a, a message so that there, there's no reactions anymore. I kind of took that out to, to simplify the application, but the, the message is the more important thing. It's going to take in a message and then it's going to basically push that message onto the wave list. So every time a message comes in, it adds that message to the wave list array. And then if we want to see all of those messages, then we can do the get all waves. And then we can also get a number of how many waves there are with waveless.length. So this should be fairly comprehensible if you know, like, you know, general programming constructs, the syntax may look a little weird, but all that's really happening here is we're defining a struct, defining an array, and then pushing kind of like objects onto that array. But since this is just Solidity code, you may be thinking, well, how do I get this thing on the blockchain though? And the way you actually get this thing onto the blockchain is with Hardhat. So Hardhat is a develop, developer tool that makes working with 
blockchains really, really easily. So what's happening here is we're going to tell it that we want to deploy our wave portal contract. So we first defined this contract. We just write the contract word, then give it a name. And it's like a, you know, a, a object or constructor kind of thing. And then we're going to run the get contract factory. And then we're going to run this deploy command. And then what this does is it actually can, you can tell it which blockchain you want to deploy it to. So we have this hard hat config file right now. And we're going to tell it to deploy to the Robston chain. So when you're getting into this kind of Web3 stuff, you're going to hear about a lot of different blockchains. And you got a lot of terms. This is going to be really confusing. I would recommend kind of like the first thing you should learn is learn Ethereum. But when you learn Ethereum, you actually realize you don't deploy to Ethereum. So if you want to deploy something to Ethereum, you got to pay money. So you don't really want to have to pay $10 in gas just to build a Hello World application. So what you do is you deploy it to Robston. Robston is like the fantasy version, fantasy parallel version of Ethereum that people can interact with in essentially the same way, but all the money is fake money. You don't actually pay for the money. So you can just go into what's called a faucet and ask for Ether on Robston. They just give it to you. It's just free. So when you're deploying, when you're developing this kind of stuff, you're going to develop on a test net and you're going to deploy it to a test net. And you're going to test it on the test net. And then once you've done that many times and hired various companies to audit your contracts, then you deploy it to actual main chain. So today we're going to just deploy it to Robston, but it's going to give you a good idea of like, what does it mean to kind of get something onto a blockchain? Now I'm going to hop off screen for a second. because there's going to be two things I'm going to have to put in here that I don't want to expose. There's going to be the endpoint for our Robston URL. Now this is what we're going to be getting from quicknode.com. So this is the company that I work for. This is a blockchain infrastructure company. So what's really great about uh, Quicknode is that it allows you to like very, very simply get spun up with an endpoint. So right here we can see our endpoint and I'm not gonna show the whole thing because at the end of the endpoint is essentially like an API key. You don't wanna expose your um, actual endpoint to the world. You always wanna keep this in like a, a environment file or something like that and all you do is just grab that endpoint and then put it right here and then you also need a private key for a wallet so this is what i was talking about before how when you deploy these things it's associated with a specific person's wallet so i have a uh, metamask over here and for people who are familiar with metamask it's kind of the most you know popular well-known browser-based wallet. So when you're getting started, you, you usually start with MetaMask. And then in MetaMask over here, you can get set up on Robston Testnet. And then you can see here, I already kind of sent some Robston to myself on the Robston faucet over here. So if I were to do this again, I would just grab my address here, copy it to the clipboard, put it there, and then give me Robston. And this is similar to what you would do if this was real money and I wanted to transact with, say, Jim. Jim would send me his wallet's public address and then I would be able to send him money from my wallet. Any questions so far on, on, on all that? Yeah, I had a quick question. Um, you said you can actually hire companies to audit your smart contracts. Um, do you have any? Do you have any company names, or uh, I guess anything I can just kind of do a quick search on to learn a little bit more about that? Yeah. Um, so Trail of Bits is one that I know is very established and has been around for a while. So that would be the first one to look at. There's definitely many more, and that I'm not aware of. But this, uh, it's a very kind of specific specialty now, where once you kind of put so much money into a system like this and then it's all exposed through a single programming language like think about how many bugs have been in like you know javascript code throughout you know your career imagine if every time there was a bug in your javascript code that meant one of your users could steal your other users money like that would be a, a huge issue and you would probably think differently about how you write that javascript code right so with solidity you need to basically go over every single line with like a fine tooth comb of like, what is this line of code doing? 
how does that interact with the EVM? What is this line of code compiled down to? What is like the entire you know, access chain involved with that? So this is why if you want to actually like put a smart contract out into the world that actual people's funds are going to interact with, you should hire an expert to go over that contract first to make sure that you're not going to deploy this and then everyone's going to instantly get their money stolen. Got it. Thank you. This is why you hear about so many scams in the in the space, right? Like we're constantly hearing about, you know, so-and-so gets hacked and so-and-so loses $100 million and, you know, so-and-so gets their board ape stolen and all this kind of stuff because any bug is like very, very consequential. But at the same time, if all this stuff has like, the reason why people are trying to steal from this because it's generated so much value also. So that's like another thing to keep in mind. Okay, um, I need to actually grab... I was talking instead of doing, but gonna grab those and there I go. Anthony, while you're doing that, does this technology fundamentally have to be financially related? I mean, so I know we're using MetaMask and we have wallet addresses. Like, there could be applications of this that are not related to money or you, I guess you always need it to deploy and interact with the network. Is that? Yeah, this is, this is a common question I get. So the reason why there's always going to be money involved with a blockchain is because if you could do, if you, if they gave the ability to interact with it in a way that doesn't require some sort of payment, then they have no way of guaranteeing that people aren't going to DDoS the network basically. And people aren't going to spam it and just like run the whole network down. So the fact that you have to pay to use Ethereum, the fact that gas exists at all is a security mechanism actually. And then it also has these knock on effects, which is that the people running the network actually make money, you know? Cause if you think about like, yeah, you know, great. so many people are doing these open source projects and building all this code and they're not being compensated for it. So it, to me, it's kind of acknowledging like the reality that like computers aren't free. Computing power isn't free. Human time isn't free. Now I will say though, I mentioned IPFS very briefly. IPFS is not a blockchain, but it's very similar to blockchain. You could think of it like Pirate Bay and Git had a baby. That's what IPFS is. And so with that, you don't have to pay. Like you can push something onto IPFS. You could put a website on IPFS and then you could like give people this like long, ridiculous content hash representing your website. And that's all free. So there's stuff in web three that's based more around like actual putting websites up on the internet that is free. And so I think that's, that's pretty cool and worth looking at. And so this maybe is a little philosophical, but do you think that this, so I think open source is awesome. I'm a huge advocate for it, um, but it struggles to find a business model to, that makes sense for a lot of folks without, you know, resorting to like open core or other types of things, you know, dual licensing, that kind of thing. Um, do you think that this technology can solve some of that problem? So it's like, it, it's kind of forcing payment and uh, interaction in order to use apps and, and make it make sense that way. Or is it, I will say it's at the very least it's introducing novel ideas to tackle these problems, which I think is really important because you are always going to be at the end of the day deciding on like resource allocation because even if this blockchain is still generating all these coins that are worth all this money it's still a question of like well who gets those coins and that's where all the math with the miners comes in of like who gets how much for mining what kind of block and stuff like that but the more interesting stuff is you could actually write your blockchain from the start where you say okay 20% of all coins mined are going to go to core developers and it's just going to be there. And then once people vote on who the core developers are, they will get paid out. So there's mechanisms like that. And then you get involved in like voting and like weird social stuff. And so it's, it's not like a silver bullet, but it's like, a, it's a, it's at least an attempt to kind of build in financial mechanisms in these things to make sure that the developers get paid. Sweet. Okay, let me get back to the screen sharing. Okay, so just to recap what I'd done here, I have this smart contract and I have this deploy script. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna run yarn, yarn hard hat compile. And what that did is it took our smart contract and it compiled it. And that is 
so you can then actually take that binary and then like shove it up onto the blockchain so the next step we're going to do is yarn hard hat run and we're going to just run that deployment script and then we're going to give it a network flag that's going to specify the ropston test network specifically and then this step can sometimes take a long time so this may take like 10 to 15 seconds but basically the reason why this takes a long time is because ethereum produces a new block every like 12 to 14 seconds so if you want to write something to ethereum you like submit it the ethereum nodes receive those over the course of 12 to 14 seconds, they assemble the blocks and then the blocks are like declared and then they're like made part of the, the blockchain. So that's why it takes a little bit of time. But once it is done, you have your contact address. So this is our contract for our smart contract. And to interact with this, we're going to put it in our project here. So let me... First, uncomment a bunch of stuff. So I'm going to change that contract address. So we're going to set it to a contract address variable. And then this is kind of the more like Web3 library kind of stuff. And this is like letting you basically connect to a blockchain with like three lines of code, which is really, really sweet. So what this is doing is it's first checking do you have a crypto wallet at all? So this is going to check the browser's window actually, which is like, if you know the, the window object is like, you need to go all the way up to the chain to see like what's actually happening in this web browser. So you go to the window and you see, does this person have an Ethereum wallet? So that's gonna check to basically see, do you have MetaMask? If you do have MetaMask, it's gonna say, okay, cool. This is now your provider. This is the representation of you as a user. We're then going to take that provider, your smart contract and the application binary interface associated with it and the contract itself. And then we're going to create a contract object that you can interact with in JavaScript. So this is what's really cool if you're a JavaScript developer, this is going to do this whole translation from blockchain into JavaScript for you. So right now, where you get to write JavaScript code to interact with the blockchain, even though like Ethereum doesn't speak JavaScript. Like there's no concept of JavaScript in Ethereum at all. But with something like Ethers, they allow you to basically say, okay, we're going to write this API that's going to take RPC calls that you would need to write to interact with Ethereum and then turn that into JavaScript functions. That makes it like super, super easy for, for JavaScript developers. And then you get to just run a JavaScript function that corresponds with your smart contract function. So this get all waves smart contract function is now a uh, ethers JS JavaScript function that will then just give us an object, which is all of your waves. And this is just kind of some normalizing your, your timestamps to make sure they look nice. And then it uses uh, Svelte on mount to actually mount that to the thing okay um so there's gonna be a lot of code here but um i'll try and be as succinct as possible with it so people don't get too confused oh i know what i, I know what i did here Boom. okay so we got three components that is kind of making up the the majority of our application we have our wallet component and so our wallet component is what's checking that we have a MetaMask wallet and then it's looking through your wallets to like kind of grab an account because you can have multiple accounts in a wallet. Don't worry about that too much. And then we're going to give you a button that you can click to connect your wallet. So that is the really important thing to always be aware of as you get into this stuff is that don't click random buttons in Web3 unless you're like comfortable losing your, your stuff because anytime you connect your wallet, you are kind of trusting that service that is not going to have code that's going to be malicious. So anytime, if someone just is ever sending you random crypto spam, they're like, hey, airdrop, you had a free thing, connect your wallet. Like that's not a free thing. They're stealing your thing actually. So like be very wary of that. 
let me get this going now. Um, let me do that and that. Okay. All right, so now we have our components on screen and we're gonna have the connect to MetaMask button. We're gonna have an input field to write our message. And then the wave at me button is what takes that message and then sticks it on the blockchain for you. So let's first just start by connecting our wallet. I also am console logging some stuff here that may help you out a bit. Okay, so I was already kind of logged in and have been connected to this before. So it kind of recognized and was like, hey, you want to connect to this again? Cool. And this is where you can see your wallet is actually connected to it. And then here it's telling us our um, Ethereum, our actual wallet address. So this is what I was saying, how when you check for your MetaMask wallet, it sets it to the provider object. And that provider object is like you. Like this is my wallet's address. And this is like something that identifies me if I ever post this address out into the world. So we're connected now and we can actually interact with the wave. So let's see, how do we actually do that though? Now what we need to do is instead of just connecting our wallet, we need to sign a message so that anytime someone writes a message to the smart contract, they have to sign it with their wallet. So basically it's like signing a cryptographic key or it's like, you know, putting in a password. So it ensures an extra level of security that this is who they say they are. And then it also ensures that there's a, a ledger of all the changes and who made those changes. And, and this is the stuff I was talking about, about how this is like focused on the individuals and how the individuals interact with this stuff. Cause every individual is going to have their own wallet. Like you could have a corporation that could like own a wallet that they could have like a bunch of people kind of controlling. But for the most part, this is just like people on their computers with wallets interacting with this stuff. And so I think that's pretty cool. Most of these things that we're seeing now are similar to what we saw in the last component. We're checking the window and then we're importing our contract address, our ABI. And then the only difference here is now we have this signer, which we just run a get signer function on the provider going back to ether is giving us really nice kind of apis to to figure this out and then we're going to have this text area here that's going to do an on change with the message and then it's going to uh send wave reaction which is this whole function right here when you actually click the button and then the only other thing is the wave list. We'll look at that once we actually write a message. So hopefully this all went according to plan. This is the step where they're saying, hey, you need to sign this transaction. So your wallet pops up and it says, you need to confirm this transaction. This is the part you tell you to be wary of. This is the part where they'll steal your stuff if it's a, trans if it's a contract you don't actually want to connect to. So we're going to confirm that, and then we're going to sit and wait patiently for 15 to 20 seconds. While we're waiting, Anthony, um, so is there some security in knowing, like, when your wallet's popping up, it's providing you details with something that you're, like, you essentially can trust, right? Like, your wallet is giving you information that you can trust. So, like, if they're saying, in order to complete this, you have to send this amount, is that safe at that point or can like can that still be misleading where you think you're sending one thing or, or doing a smaller transaction than you than is reality i guess this is this is where it's it's really tricky for people who aren't really like coders because a lot of times when you're being asked to sign a transaction like you can dig in and you can see what the transaction is they're actually asking you to do and it's gave you this like huge json blob of like methods and stuff and if you know what those mean you can go read through it and you can be like okay they said they're going to give me something, but they're actually the, the JSON here says they're going to take something. So it's not that you can't see what's going to happen is that like people are interacting with these things who don't actually know how code works and who don't know how to actually read code. And so what they do is they'll basically write, they'll, they'll have like a button that says like get a free airdrop. And then they click the button and then you confirm the transaction, but you didn't look at 
what was the actual transaction because mm. you're just like skipping through this menu really quickly and most people have, like who are using metamask they have no idea what metamask is actually doing you know mm. so there's mm. like a huge information gap here and this is what makes it so easy to scam people because you can set up a line of like things to click and messages that make it seem like you know exactly what's going on until the very end when you click that button and realize there's something behind the scenes that they're like carefully hiding from you that you could have looked at but you didn't look at because you were following along interesting yeah so you kind of have to audit it. that so metamask isn't providing tons of clarity around that because it seems like it'd be since they're authorizing kind of the the end transaction there it'd be nice because it looks like on yours it said you're sending this amount or something like that right wouldn't that so, be so let's look at this one more time yeah. so if we take a look at what's happening here so this is the the contract interaction so let's see if that's going to load for us there's the hexadecimal which is of course super useful so normally when you're signing a transaction it should give you more information i'm not sure why it's not right now there's also lots of other wallets out there so there's always kind of like a there's at least competition in the space so if like one wallet is like dropping the ball on security other wallets can kind of come in sure let me see if i can actually get this to show something let's see um okay here we go so this is Transaction, transaction. So this is what we're looking at right now is Ether scan. Mm -hmm. So this is the like the blockchain itself, a way to kind of like read it and and query it and try and understand it a bit. And so you can go look at the contract. And then here's the contract. And oh my god, look at that. <laughs> so it's like you can decompile the contract to look at the code if you're willing to wait like 86 minutes and this is the exact reason why things like avalanche exist because like there's no reason why you should have to wait 86 minutes to do something like that because like mm -hmm. the ethereum network has like certain bottlenecks in it so this is where you can see like if i wanted to go look at the smart contracts code it's on the blockchain like the code is on the blockchain you can go look at it if you want you can see what the contract is actually doing mm -hmm. but the vast majority of people aren't going to do that and the vast majority of people are going to just click the button and then hope for the best and that's yeah. why like you, you shouldn't really interact. You shouldn't really put your money into this stuff until you have a clear understanding of how it works. And this is why I recommend people like, if you want to invest in crypto and you want to get involved in it, this is not financial advice, but you should start with something like Coinbase because Coinbase, they hold your keys for you, which some people say, that means you don't owe your you don't own your money. It means Coinbase owns your money. It's like, well, yeah, but the bank owns my money too. So mm -hmm. there's companies that will allow you to kind of put trust in them to make sure that you are saving yourself from getting owned. Like if you put your sure. money in Coinbase, you can't click a button and give away all your funds because it's not just sitting in a wallet that you're using and you're interacting with on the internet. So there's ways to protect your funds. And the main thing is like, if you just have money in a MetaMask wallet, then you're always vulnerable to these kind of attacks, these kind of social engineering type things. Because anytime you're clicking a button in your metamask wallet you have to like have done your research like what's actually doing and this is why it's just like mm -hmm. if you're going to buy like an nft or something like don't buy an nft in some random project you just like heard about like if you've heard of like if you can go research it you can find out who's the team behind it you can see there's a company behind it you can see there's like individuals putting their name behind it that's usually a good sign mm -hmm. if you are seeing something and you go research it and you can't figure out who it is, where the website is, and there's just this random Twitter account with 50,000 followers, that's probably a bot farming kind of thing. Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> Hopefully in the future, this stuff gets a little more transparent. I feel like the reality is most people, myself included, are going to just click buttons and don't have time to audit you know, everybody's code at the end of the day. So hopefully someday that this, this becomes a little more secure to. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the services are already there that are, that are secure and that are doing that for you, but it's about knowing who those services are and knowing sure. which ones to trust and which one is not to. So yep. having a, a web three friend is, is useful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, great. So that's the, that's the application now, but this is not a Jamstack application yet though. We obviously we got to put it on Netlify or Vercel or else it's not Jamstack. Right. So what's cool though is, this whole thing is just a static website right now. Like quite literally 
there's nothing, we don't even have to include any environment variables because our contract address is hard coded in. So if we want to now deploy this, all you gotta do is run the Vercel command and then click through all of this. Now what this is gonna do is it's gonna just take your project, push it up to Vercel, and Vercel now owns the man who created Svelte. So that's kind of like owning Svelte, I guess. So there's nice Svelte integrations. And then what this is going to do is it's going to not only deploy our application, but it's going to deploy our application with the messages we've already created because the contract hasn't changed. The fact that we're interacting with the contract through local hosts or through the actual website is irrelevant. And that's the, the decoupled nature coming in here is that when you deploy a project locally with like SQLite and then you spin up a production database and then you redeploy the app, then you're like kind of back at zero, right? But with this, you are, we were already interacting with our backend even on local host. And we were writing these messages into the blockchain even from local host. And so that's kind of the, the Jamstack E decoupled nature coming in here. So here is our website. On first of all, I don't want this on Brave. I want this on Chrome. We go here, connect, and then there's our message. And we're gonna say hello from Vercel. The Vercel team. So I gotta connect this first. So the Vercel team is pretty into Web three stuff. There's already a decent amount of Web three projects that are running like their front ends and like kind of uh, like web, uh, like, you know, marketing pages and stuff like that on Vercel. And then you have a, a lot of dApps that are starting to be built with Next.js. Netlify is not down with Web3 though. Like I know a lot of developer advocates at Web3 and they think it's bad news. So I wouldn't expect Netlify to get involved in Web3 anytime soon, but Vercel is basically already there. All right, Did someone just do that. Is there is there a technical reason for that, or is it it's just a difference in community, or what's? Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, it's it's yeah, it's definitely a difference in philosophy. I think that you know the, the people who I've talked to at Netlify about it, they just think that it's you know they, they don't think that the technology has much promise. They think that it's being used for a lot of scams, and they think that you know there's there there are negative externalities of Web three, and like I'm not gonna like sit here and tell you there's no bad things in web three so i think like when you have companies that are like raising these concerns like those concerns are valid you know and, and that's totally fine i think the the thing you have to do though is you have to really separate who are the bad actors in this space and are those bad actors the developers or is it people who are coming in and trying to break these systems and steal money from people because like when people talk about crypto scams and people talk about like web three bros and people talk about like all this stuff, they, all, they lump it all into the same barrier. But the people scamming people on Web3 are not the people building Web3 applications. Those are two separate groups of people, you know? So, like, we would love for there to be less people trying to steal everything from, from Web3. That would be awesome. But the, the thing that you really got to think about is, like, do you want to give users kind of access to this new world? Because it means that there's going to be higher risk involved, but also means they're going to potentially have a lot of upside in terms of getting involved in this new technology and getting it on the ground floor. And like people who bought Ethereum, like I bought, so this is a funny story. I bought a, some Ethereum in like 2017 and then ended up like I had a couple of years after that where I had like no job. It was like broke off my ass. And so I sold all my crypto, but there was some Ethereum that I forgot about and did not actually sell. And I found a Ethereum paper wallet <laughs> that I had screenshotted just uh, like a couple months ago. And that Ethereum that I'd, I probably paid maybe like one, two, three, maybe at most $300 for was worth $10,000 over the course of that five years is how much nice. it was worth. So Good for if you. you get involved in this stuff in the beginning, like you actually might find that you're going to get the types of returns that the startup founders are getting by building these things. Cause if you're building, you know, like a super base or something like that, you're going to get those same returns, but only if you're a founder and only if you're an accredited investor who makes $200,000 a year or has like a certain amount of money, but like there's all these legal, like there's laws based on 
whether you're allowed to invest in early stage companies. Like, so for me, this is about actually also giving people like access to financial investments and tech innovations that could pay off in the long run. But that also means you have to be responsible for those investments because there's going to be a thousand blockchains and maybe 10 of those are going to still be around, you know, a couple of years from now. So you got to do your due diligence, but that due diligence can pay off like in a magnitude you can't even imagine. And there's our messages. Cool. That's the whole demo. This is super cool, Anthony. I, this is the first time I'm actually like really seeing this stuff. And I feel like you did a great job of breaking this down and, and showing like all the actual parts that go into getting something like this working. So thank you for walking us through that. Yeah, I also got a shout out Natter Dabbit. Natter Dabbit was originally leading DevRel at Amplify before leaving to do DevRel at Edge and Node. He's now at a different company. Now he's at a Celestia. But um, he, about a year ago, he wrote kind of like an end-to-end -end Ethereum tutorial that was like fairly similar to, to what you're seeing here, except with React instead of Svelte. So that's cool. Mm -hmm. And it was one of those things where it was like all of these JavaScript developers all of a sudden realized, oh, you mean you can just do this with JavaScript? That's awesome. <laughs> and so like once you kind of see an end-to-end -end example where you have a JavaScript app querying a blockchain then it all it becomes way less scary you know, like oh sure. I, can, I can do this actually like, if i can get data back from this blockchain like i can write a front end for it and then i, I build a dap you know it's like technically it's not a dap right now because it's on vercel so we're using essential well, there's two centralized servers here vercel is a centralized service and quicknote is a centralized service mm -hmm. so if you're a web3 purist we're cheating in two ways right now so sure this is something we should talk about real quick is when should you stick with thanks for coming Brittany. When should you stick with the kind of like decentralization purism and when should you compromise on using a centralized service because it's worth the benefits you get from using it so for us and you know developers who don't know how to run kubernetes or don't know how to run you know like ec2s at scale running a blockchain node is just way outside of, of your capabilities you know so having the ability to use a service like Quicknode gives you access to the blockchain and it doesn't make Ethereum centralized. Like Ethereum is still decentralized. Quicknode owns a bunch of nodes that they're going to give you access to, but like nothing has changed here in terms of the actual deal in terms of the contract. So the, the decentralized aspect is still there even when you're using a centralized service and then you're putting trust in that centralized service. If you wanted to, you could leave Quicknode at any point in time to keep that entire app exactly the same and change out that one URL I showed you and change it to you know, Alchemy or Infura or one of our competitors and your entire app will run exactly the same because we're just connecting to this blockchain just like everyone else. We're not doing anything fancy there for you except running servers on a global scale, you know? And then the front end part is being done by Vercel. So that's a centralized service. So that's where IPFS comes in. If I want my front end to be on a decentralized, unstoppable protocol, then I'll put on IPFS but there's like all these issues with IPFS is super slow, super unreliable. It's like, you got all these conventions you got to learn. So for me, I think using these node providers and using these front end Jamstack providers allows you to build a web three application with almost as little friction as you would building a web two application. Yeah. It seems like you need some folks helping smooth out the experience to have on ramps like these different services, just because uh, it is complicated. And I think even at this level, I think people need to understand how these things work. So I think it's great that, that there's innovation happening in that space. It feels a lot to me, kind of like early days of the internet, right? So in the, in the beginning, people kind of thought the internet was a fad. It's hard to believe now looking back at that, but um, you know, you know, people are trying to read their newspapers on it and it was like, ah, I don't know if we can do much more than this and, and look at it now. So um, I'm definitely interested to see where the space goes. It seems like there's a lot of promise there. Um, I, I totally get the hesitancy too. I, I think, you know, anything new, there's going to be lots of grifters and you want to make sure that balance is mostly creators and, and less grifters. And I think people get freaked out by that. And, but I don't and you think... shouldn't take people's word for anything in tech. I mean, people are telling sure. you this thing does this and has all these benefits. The first thing you should say is we'll prove it, you know? Sure. So that's, that's true of blockchain. That's true of deployment providers. That's true of open source frameworks. So like I, I encourage everyone to be skeptical of every single piece of tech out there. Yeah. But what's cool about blockchain is like when you start digging into it, you're like, oh, this is actually built on like 
40 years of cryptography research that's like extremely academically rigorous to the point where like it's gonna make your brain hurt if you try and actually dig into these protocols yeah no yeah it's very very cool um do, do any folks on the calls uh have questions for anthony i'd like to open up the floor if you want to ask questions about the demo or web3 in general thanks for all coming out super happy to have an audience here yeah thank you anthony i'll throw out um just some links for people i am on the twitters as ajc web dev along with um github and you can just go to actually ajcwebdev.com to find my blog as well. And so I'm putting out Web3 content and then also like just general kind of web development content. I'm still very much into like new JavaScript front end or open source kind of kind of tools. And I'm still hosting FS Jam, which we had Jim on, which was super fun. Oh, yeah, way back in the day. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for coming, it's a great Lucas. Podcast. And then if you want to check out QuickNode, I only showed you Ethereum, but we have chains. We have 14 chains right now. So if you are interested in kind of like, you know, expanding out into the other areas of the blockchain world, I think that it does a good job of exposing you to more of them, but not too many of them. So if you go on like coin market cap, you're like, you're going to see like 10,000 coins. You're like, well, how do I like, they're ranked, but like, how do I know what to do with these, you know? So just getting to work for a company like QuickNode and see like what chains are supported, what goes into like having a chain be supported here. It makes me feel more confident in like the time and money and energy I put into learning a chain and to interact with a chain. So I can be like, okay, I can see that Avalanche is going to stick around. Like I feel very, very confident in, in saying that. Thanks everyone for coming. But you know, the only reason why I can say that, or I can say like Solana is is gonna stick around is because I'm seeing the back and I'm seeing what is actually getting adoption, you know. So you you you're gonna have to, if you really are interested in this stuff, you're really gonna have to do your research, you have to talk to a lot of people, but you'll find people are actually more open to sharing this information than than you think. Yeah. No, that's great. If we wanted to to learn yeah, you know, just to, to dive in and start learning more about developing for Web three. Where where would you recommend we look look next? <laughs> yeah, so um, Patrick Collins, I will post something that he did. He is the premier um, kind of educator in the space right now. He just like within the last month actually released a thirty two hour course on the entire end to end getting into web three for javascript developers and like it's more high quality you're, you're going to find courses that are going to cost you thousands of dollars and i guarantee you they are not going to be better than his course like his course is going to be the best and it's going to be free so as they start with that one um let me see if i can find this and then natter dabbit has a lot of great stuff as well he's got like these kind of a lot of the end-to-end -end type examples that I've been showing is stuff that he will do. So let me drop his um, Ethereum. If you're interested in learning about real. blockchain, this and then is for you. if you want to like, so what's funny is actually, so that example that I used today, I, I mentioned this before the call, I, I figured out how to do that from a guide from my own company. So QuickNode had a guide of how to connect a Svelte app to Ethereum. So like, this is one like uh, I'm not just hawking my company's product right now. Like the, the quick note guides are really, really good. They're really well written. They're really thorough. So you can learn a ton just from reading our guides. And then um, I'm doing weekly live streams. So I've walked through a couple um, projects kind of like this on the quick note uh, YouTube and uh, Twitch account. So if you want to hang out on any of those, I'm going to be like putting out content about this stuff for probably many years to come. So I, I'm very passionate about creating good educational material for this stuff. So I think it's still pretty sparse, but um, there's, there's enough out there for you to get started for sure. You just kind of have to know where to look. So I'll say start with Patrick Collins, start with Natter Dabbit, and then check out some quick notes stuff. And that should give you like plenty to work on for like the next month or two, you know? <laughs> That's great. Th thank you very much. This was really interesting. And I mean, just really th things that I was completely unaware of, really. Uh, I mean, thinking of the blockchain essentially as a back end to, to something had never 
it, you know, it's not not something I'd ever thought about. It. So, uh, I, I know, I, like I, blockchain, the most poorly explained piece of technology ever. I think. <laughs> 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 yeah, so no, that's that's, that's really great. I, re I really want to do some research and learn some more about it because it looks like a, you know, a really fascinating uh, emerging technology. Yeah, I mean, it's gonna it's gonna stretch your your mind muscles to kind of like learn it, which I think is really cool. You know, it's always nice to kind of like you know expand as a developer, like what's actually possible to do with these things. And I would also say, like anyone out there wants, like you know, DM me, ask questions, looking for more resources. Like I'm always available. Like this is kind of my job as. A DevRel person is to to be out there talking to the the people, kissing babies, and all that stuff. So always happy to to you know help anyone out who's looking to do this stuff. If you, if you want to get a job in Web three, I can help you out with that too. Well, <laughs> I've I've already brought up your LinkedIn page to connect you. So <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I would say I've heard that um, senior Solana developers are currently making around a million dollars a year. Oof. <laughs> Okay, I'll take one of those. <laughs> exactly. <Sign up. laughs> um, that so yeah, you're out there kissing the crypto babies, Anthony. That's uh... <laughs> all day, every day. I mean, it's like it's a combination. Like you gotta you gotta punch people on Twitter and then kiss the baby. Yeah, yeah, that's a good punching by day, kissing baby by night. That's um, great. Uh, I guess I had a quick question about um, just like it seems like the financial service industry with you know crypto currencies and stuff has kind of been the first testing ground for blockchain technology what do you think the next industry is going to be in this space because there's obviously now there's a whole open source developer community working on this do you see certain apps being built or certain organizations adopting this technology do you have any um, predictions about where this might go next yeah i the the really big unlock is going to be if we can get a crypto social network created because all the stuff that we've been kind of showing as i've been talking about there's been things with like identity and and ownership and and stuff like that and control over how the thing works so that's really really useful for a social app if you think about it like no one can like there was this big question when elon musk was talking about buying twitter people like is elon musk going to open source the twitter algorithm you can't close source a blockchain algorithm. If you wrote Twitter on a blockchain, it would be open source by default. So that's really cool. And there's something called the Lens Protocol, which is the first kind of version of this that is starting to pick up. So I would definitely point people to this. I think this is super, super interesting. And then I've talked about this a couple times already, which is IPFS. And then there's another one called Rweave, which are about how do you create permanence for not just these transactions but for like websites and for the the internet itself and so i think that's going to be really cool and then you're also seeing there's there's already jamstack versions of this so there's a company called fleek which is basically will build a jamstack site on your ipfs for you so all that stuff i think is super interesting actually while i'm dropping all these links i should drop I have an IPFS blog post. So, and again, I want to, you know, at some point, I, I know folks got to hop off and I want to be respectful of people's time, but um, IPFS, uh, how does this work? Is there like a centralized organization kind of like the same way that we dole out IP addresses thinking about this stuff or is there a company behind it? How, how does this stuff work? There's a lab behind it. So have you ever heard of Bell Labs? Yeah. So Protocol Labs is behind IPFS and they're modeled on Bell Labs. Actually, they see themselves as a research lab that's funded as a company also. And so they are the ones who have been pushing IPFS. And there's a blockchain called Filecoin that is about creating a tokenized incentivization, incentivization structure to basically pay people to store things on their computer. And that was the, the largest ICO in the, the bubble from like 2017 to 2018. And so they, they survived, even though they, they got like this crazy valuation that they, you know, no one knew what to do with, but that is a lot, a lot of stuff is really interesting wrapped up in that because it has to do with like, just think about link rot on the internet, right? Like how many times do links just go dead? Like a link can't go dead. Well, Technically, IPFS garbage collects itself, so that's some kind of an asterisk. But for the most part, if you pin something, a link will be on IPFS forever. And that's really cool if you want to guarantee your website is always going to be up. And companies like Cloudflare already provide gateways to interact with IPFS. So there's already Web2 companies that have built infrastructure 
to work with IPFS. It's just super, super janky and does not work very well. So it, it's fun to play around with, but like I would never host my actual own personal site on IPFS, but I probably would on Fleek because Fleek is a centralized service that's making IPFS a lot nicer. So this is about there's, there's always these trade-offs of the decentralized stuff is usually going to be a little janky, but there may be a centralized service that's going to make interacting with that decentralized thing really, really nice. So yeah, Fleek is uh, in the same mold as like QuickNode in that respect. And also, I imagine, you know, standardized browsers have to build capabilities as well. I know, like Brave, for instance, um, interacts with like unstoppable domains and things like that. But I, I assume that yeah, browsers have to like up. kind of like... I have an unstoppable domain. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 Um, so I, I assume that eventually the whole ecosystem has to kind of come on. This. So it'll probably take some time to make it make well, sense, right? Yeah, so right now there's there's hacks. Basically what you do is you write a DNS record that takes a text record and points it to a, a content hash on IPFS. So there's ways you can link up DNS and IPFS. It just takes a little bit of knowledge of DNS itself. But this is the stuff like over the next couple of years, that's all going to get ironed out and people are going to just be buying domains that are actually crypto domains and they're not going to really be able to tell the difference. Sounds cool. I'm excited for it. Okay. I, I think that's this is probably a good uh, breaking point unless other folks have dire questions they want to ask before we end. Yeah, great questions. That was super, super fun. I'm, I'm always glad when people are actually interested in this stuff because, you know, I have, I came from the web two worlds and I've been like going through, have my network of people and be like, Hey, you want to talk about this? You want to talk about that? And, like <laughs> some people are like, cool. That sounds interesting. Some people are like, Nah, man, I want to talk about Web three. <laughs> anyway, I don't want to talk about Web three stuff, you know. So I just, yeah. I just hope that people can stay open minded about it, you know. And like, you know, like I say, like I'm not saying it's all good stuff. Like I will, I will. Like there's Terra, there's this blockchain that lost forty billion dollars yep. in the span of like three days. Like that's a bad thing. I'll happily call that out, you know. Mm -hmm. But you know, that's that's not that's not the whole industry, you know. Yeah. Well, Anthony, thank you so much for coming on and talking to the group. Um, really appreciate it. I thought the talk was great and fielding questions was really helpful. So thank you so much. Awesome. Yeah, happy to be here. Hopefully we can do another one sometime. All right. Great.